Hello, thank you for choosing to visit with us today at the Bellamy Mansion Museum of History and Design Art. My name is Annie Jacobs, and on behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to welcome you today and hope that you will have a pleasant experience with us. In 1861, at the onset of the Civil War, Dr. John Bellamy, his wife Eliza Bellamy, their nine children, and nine enslaved African Americans resided here. Your tour today will focus on those individuals who lived and worked here, the history surrounding those individuals, and the unique architecture of the property. Okay, let's get started. Your tour will begin in the backyard. Notice the uh, brick building that was the carriage house in the 1860s when the Bellamy's moved into their new home. Above the carriage house, Guy and Tony had their sleeping quarters. Guy and Tony were the two enslaved men who lived on the property. In the backyard, it was very much like a small plantation in 1861 when the Bellamy's took possession of their home. There was a lot going on here in this backyard. It was all dirt for one thing. You would not see the ornamental gardens that you see here today. There's also the poultry house here, which now serves as our modern day restrooms. Just imagine this yard with turkeys and chickens and ducks all around and all of the activity. It was a very, very busy place. Also notice the well, which is covered with the wooden board, the cistern from which the rainwater was collected and then pumped up to the holding tank in the attic on the third floor. Guy, who was the coachman and the butler, performed this task every morning, pumping the water up to the holding tank. We like to say that the Bellamy's were going green back in 1861 and they didn't even know it, where they were harvesting the rainwater and using it for laundry and bathing purposes. Also notice the coal storage bin. It held 10 to 15 tons of coal because coal was used throughout the house to fuel the fireplaces, to fuel the cook stove. Even the laundry room was fueled by coal. Just imagine what this backyard looked like. On any given morning, you would have Guy pumping the water, Sarah gathering the bacon and ham to cook for breakfast, other enslaved men, women, and children gathering eggs from the poultry house, carrying buckets of water, carrying buckets of coal to warm the house. Very busy. The Bowlby Mansion uh, features a uh, rare example of uh, urban slave quarters. There are very few of these anywhere in the United States. We're very fortunate to have one here on this site and we interpret it daily on our tours. In fact, it's the most important part of our tour. When construction began in 1859, two Northern architects, James F. Post and Rufus Bunnell, were the two people who were here designing it. Uh, they had designed much else in Wilmington, and the site was overseen by uh, black architects as well, as well as uh, craftsmen who are also African-American. It was a highly skilled group who built the place between 1859, when they started the slave quarters, and 1861, when they completed the house. In 1861, uh, the enslaved workers moved into this site. Uh, they were 10 in total. Uh, we happen to know who they were. There were seven women um, on site right here in the slave quarters. We know a lot about who they were and how their day went, the domestic work as they were enslaved on the site by the Bellamy family. The builders of the site have fascinating stories as well. Uh, Elvin Artis was the uh, overseer, the sort of foreman of the site. Uh, he was a highly accomplished man. We also have William Benjamin Gould, who was a highly, highly skilled plasterer, a very bright man with a fascinating and long family history behind him. Uh, we also have Henry Taylor, another enslaved but autonomous, hired out uh, enslaved man here. He did a lot of the carpentry work and his family went on to great things through future generations all the way up to the actual White House. Henry Taylor's descendants went on to build Tuskegee, um, become famous architects in their own right. 
that ended with Valerie Jarrett, who was a senior advisor to President Obama. We also know that the Howe, Sajwa, um, and other families in Wilmington, all of them African-American, were involved here. And the site was built by very highly skilled craftsmen uh, called mechanics at the time, actually, uh, who also lived on this site while building the main house. It took about 18 months to build the main house. So the enslaved workers who lived here, and most were black and enslaved, although some were freed, uh, stayed on the site while they built it. The laundry room, which is larger than any of the sleeping chambers in the building, was where Rosella Potter, later Rosella Simmons, washed clothing and linen for everyone on site, sometimes upwards of 20 people. This room contains the original hearth and wash pot that she used. And if the weather was good, Rosella could hang clothing outside to dry. But on inclement weather days, a rainy day, she might have actually used the clothes closet beneath the stairs in this room. Directly across from the laundry room is the only sleeping chamber on the first floor. We believe this belonged to Sarah, the enslaved cook and housekeeper. Sarah was about 45 years old when the Bellamy family moved her and themselves into the property in February of 1861. Family tradition uh, states that Sarah was actually a, possibly a wedding gift from the Harrises to John and Eliza when they were married in 1839. If that's true, then she would have been their enslaved cook and housekeeper 20 years before moving here to this property. Uh, we believe she had the first floor sleeping chamber because in the hierarchy of enslaved women, she was in charge. Having that first floor sleeping chamber allows uh, for a better river breeze, not having to climb the very steep stairs or dealing with the heat rising from the laundry room here. Uh, Sarah was actually left in charge of the premises as a quote from one of their daughters. When the Bellamy's fled, it was yellow fever. Uh, they fled and then the Civil War was raging, so they stayed away from this premises for about two and a half years, leaving Sarah as the only person here permanently for most of the uh, Civil War. Rosella's two young daughters, Harriet and Charlotte Potter, lived with her upstairs in one of the three sleeping chambers. Harriet and Charlotte were only five and four years old, but they most likely had jobs like being companions to the Bellamy's young children or even doing small tasks in the laundry room with their mother or even with Sarah in the kitchen. One of the youngest enslaved girls had not only a job but a title. Her name was Caroline. She was Jones, the wet nurse and nanny's daughter. Caroline was about seven years old and she was known as Mrs. Bellamy's little maid. While we don't have a description of what that really meant, we do know that one of the daughters, Ellen, said, Caroline followed my mother foot to foot. The middle sleeping chamber is most likely where Marianne Nixon slept. She was the youngest working enslaved girl at age 14 who actually had daily tasks that were her own responsibility. They may have been things like bringing the chamber pots down into the privies or helping Sarah in the kitchen or even Joan uh, with the children. Now this middle sleeping chamber is directly above the laundry room, meaning that the heat from that laundry room was so intense and so constant that that room is the only one that does not contain a fireplace. The rooms behind me are two mirror image privies. Uh, these are the bathrooms for the whole site. Um, they would have been part of Marianne Nixon's job to empty the chamber pots within the house and bring them and empty them here every day. The privy pits were mostly used for the male slave owners on one side and enslaved workers on the other. Uh, that's why there are two of these rooms. There are five seats in each, which gives it a sort of a communal look, but everybody used it individually. Uh, they are actually, the seats are cut to each individual person, including various ones for children because three of the enslaved uh, population here were below 10 years old. Uh, if the privies in a place like this had actually been used and filled, uh, they would be dug out from little uh, tunnels below grade, and any of the effluents in them would be dug out in a job called night soiling, which sounds absolutely disgusting and no doubt was. Dr. Bellamy's wealth, which drove this activity, uh, was really not made from being a physician. He was involved in everything from banking to the railroad industry, and he actually was one of the largest slave owners in North Carolina. He had 115 enslaved workers in 1860, spread across three counties here in North Carolina. 82 men, women, and children were, uh, were over in Groveley in Brunswick County. It was a foodstuffs plantation, uh, but where he made his windfall profit 
according to his son John Jr., one year's profit from his turpentine enterprise, it, known as Grist in Columbus County. Uh, he said that one year's profit is what paid for everything on site here. While we don't know how much that was as far as money, we know that every bit of it was made on the back of 24 enslaved men between the ages of 18 and 40, as that is who he kept working that naval stores industry in Columbus County. The Bellamy Mansion is referred to as an antebellum home, meaning built prior to the Civil War. It was built at the height of the antebellum period and also at the end of the antebellum period. Construction began in 1859 and was completed in 1861. Now this 10,000 square foot home was built by both slaves and free people of color. And there are two distinctive architectural styles used here. Notice the columns with their Corinthian capitals. Along the roof line you see dental molding. There's a pediment on the back of the house. There's also one on the front. Those elements are all Greek revival. But you'll also notice archways, arched windows with the decorative molding above those windows known as the label. On the front of the house balconies, on the rooftop a feature called the Belvedere. All those elements are Italianate. So the home is a combination of both Greek revival and Italianate architecture. There's even a smattering of Georgian thrown in with a fanlight and the Palladian window. We're often asked how much did it cost to build the house? And our answer to that question is, we do not know. But you know that Dr. Bellamy was a trained medical physician. And on that income, he could never have afforded to build a home like this. So where did the money come from? It came from two plantations. Across the river, Groveley Plantation. That plantation was over 10,000 acres where they grew wheat, corn, rice, peanuts, had cattle, sheep, and hogs. But his money-making plantation stood about 70 miles from here near Whiteville, North Carolina, called Grist's. Now, had you visited Grist's plantation in 1861, there would not have been a plantation home, nor would you have seen any crops being grown there. This was a naval stores plantation, a plantation of longleaf pine trees. Remember, it was the day of the wooden sailing ship. So wood was used in ship construction, making barrels, making shingles. But more importantly from those trees, three valuable products, tar, pitch, and turpentine. That's the money that built this house. One of Dr. Bellamy's sons writes in his memoirs that my father built this house on one year's profit from Grist's plantation. In addition to Grist's plantation, Dr. Bellamy was also involved in railroads, banking, and during the Civil War operated salt works at Wrightsville Beach. For nearly 200 years, Wilmington was the world's leading exporter of naval stores to the entire world. With the development of the steel-hulled ships, there was less of a need for these naval stores products and what was left of the industry began to creep further south to the area we would refer today as Northern Florida. Hi, my name is Beth Mentisana. I'm a docent here at the Bellamy Mansion. And I'd like to uh, show you some parts of the house that you haven't seen yet. And I'd like you to imagine that you are a guest of the Bellamy's and you've arrived by way of horse-drawn carriage at the front gates of the house. You made your way up the steep steps to the front door. You were greeted by Mr. and Mrs. Bellamy in the foyer and then escorted into the formal parlors, which is where we are now. And there's a variety of different things that I'd like to point out while we're in this space. Uh, first of all, you can see it's a pretty good size room. It can actually be made into a smaller, more intimate space by closing these huge pocket doors that you see here. You're going to see a number of architectural features throughout this space. The windows throughout much of the house, and obviously in this space as well, very large windows, lots of them. And they're actually pocket windows. And they go up into the wall, which allows a great deal of airflow. And it goes from side to side, from front to back, and from top to bottom. So you can imagine how hot it gets here in the summer months and this 
maybe crude by our standards today, but there was no air conditioning then, and it was a very effective way to cool the house. The flooring that you see here, it's wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. That was quite unusual, actually, because typically there were hardwood floors with area rugs. So this was quite a modern feature in this house. You can also see that it's quite colorful. Obviously, it is not the original carpeting that was here, but it is the original pattern. So you get a sense of Eliza's taste. The walls were left purposely white to highlight the colorful furnishings as well as the carpeting. The windows, I'd like you to imagine that there were green, heavy brocade drapes on this side, red brocade on the other side, with lace inserts and velvet tiebacks. Very dramatic. Also in this room, you have these beautiful gasoliers, sort of a play on the word chandelier. These lights were fed by coal gas. And for the families that could afford the piping that was needed to deliver the gas, you would find beautiful lights like this in homes of this kind. The plaster work is also quite intricate, and it really is a tribute to the skill of the artisans who built this house. On the walls, you'll see a number of paintings. These are original paintings that were done by the oldest Bellamy daughter. Her name was Mary Elizabeth. They called her Belle. And she was studying art at a finishing school just outside of Columbia, South Carolina. Another feature in the formal parlors are the marble fireplaces. There are 15 coal-fired fireplaces in the house. These are the only two that are marble. The mirrors that you see above the fireplaces, obviously the glass has been replaced, but the frames are original, they've been refurbished. As we make our way into the second parlor area, you will see a parlor piano. This came from Baltimore. It's vintage 1860. On the back wall, as I like to fondly refer to them, we have the happy couple, uh, John and Eliza Bellamy. These are actual photographs that you're seeing. And then just one final uh, interesting feature in this space that you won't see elsewhere, and you wouldn't see in the winter, are the mirrors on the fireplaces. During the winter months, obviously, there would be coal in those fireplaces, but in the summer months, you would have these mirrors in place. And so I'd like you to imagine if you were a lady, women wore long skirts, long dresses then, and they had hoop skirts underneath. They had lots and lots of layers of petticoats and other things. And so as they entered the room, they could very discreetly see the bottom of their skirt in the mirror on the fireplace. I'd like to welcome you to the family side of the Bellamy Mansion. Uh, this room was the library or Dr. Bellamy's office. You'll notice the carpet is much uh, plainer, it's a reproduction, and the ceiling treatment is a cornice. This is the tool that was used to recreate the cornice. In 1972, the house had a fire, and we've left these lathes so that you can see what the damage was and the gentlemen above it were the ones who, who restored the house. The Bellamy Mansion is all the story of more than the Bellamy family. It's also the story of the people who helped build the house and those who were here. And I'd like to focus in on three individuals who were a part of, of the Bellamy Mansion. The first one is William Benjamin Gould. He was the plasterer who did that marvelous plaster you saw in the formal parlors. In 1862, during the yellow fever epidemic, he escaped with 21 other enslaved people here in Wilmington and managed to elude the Confederate watch and join the Union Navy. He kept a diary, which is the only African-American diary from the Union Navy during the Civil War. Another enslaved person who worked on this house was Henry Taylor. He was a carpenter. His son, Robert, was the first African-American to study architecture and he got a degree in architecture from MIT. He designed most of the buildings at the Tuskegee University in Alabama. Uh, but when he retired, he returned to Wilmington. A third person who was in the house was General Hawley, who was uh, in command during the Union occupation in Wilmington. He was from North Carolina, but strongly opposed to slavery. And he later became the governor of Connecticut. We're now coming into the family parlor. Uh, this was the room the Bellamy's would use to gather together in in the evenings. It faced the west and so it got more sun in the evening. 
Plaster work is very nice here, but nothing like the ornate plaster work in the formal parlors across the hall. We have some uh, portraits of some of the Bellamy children. Over the sofa is Robert Bellamy, who was the youngest of the children, the only one born in this house. He started a pharmacy business, which is still in business today, and he built a large house next door, which burned in the early 1980s, and it's now our parking lot. Another son, a middle child, was John Bellamy, Jr., who studied law, was in local government, in the General Assembly, and served as congressman from this area for many years. The third portrait is of young Chesley, who was studying at Davidson College near Charlotte, will now be going upstairs to the bedroom level. I hope you've been enjoying your tour of the Bellamy Mansion. We are now on the adult bedroom level. And on the east side of the house, the two bedrooms belong to Mr. and Mrs. Bellamy. And they also had a master bath, which was quite unusual. And on the opposite side of the house were the guest rooms, because the children slept in the attic. There's a couple of architectural features at this level that I'd like to point out, one of which is the thickness of the wall between these two bedrooms. It's only on this level and along this wall, and it is to accommodate closets. That was quite a modern feature in that time period. Most people stored their clothing in trunks or armoires. They call this a step-in closet. It's not a full walk-in. And you can see here that they would have some shelving. This is some original shelving in this closet. And a row of pegs, because hangers had not yet been invented. Another architectural feature uh, that I've already mentioned is the bathroom. The bathroom was an unusual room in most houses in that time period. And people typically bathed using a pitcher and a basin. Water would have been heated on the stove, and that's how they would have bathed. This house enabled the family to bathe three different ways, not only the traditional way, but also in bathtubs and in a shower. I'd like to step back and tell you a little bit about an individual who has given us quite a bit of information about this family, about the slaves that lived here, and about this home. And her name was Ellen Bellamy. She was one of the Bellamy children. In fact, she was the middle child. And Ellen never married. She lived in this house until she died at the age of 94 in 1946. And Ellen wrote her memoirs when she was 87. She called them Back with the Tide which we happen to sell in the gift shop. And there's a lot of information that we use in interpreting the house from Ellen's memoirs. So just a couple of quick stories about Ellen. They described her as a dyed-in-the-wool confederate. Um, and just to kind of give you a sense of Ellen, the wheelchair that you see in the room is a rather ancient-looking wheelchair. It was at the time that Ellen was living here. At the end of her life, she had difficulty getting up and down the stairs, so she was basically living in the two uh, bedrooms on the east side of the house. We did add some conveniences for her there in terms of a, a toilet, a tub, and a sink, and a small kitchen on the back porch, and she had a housekeeper who was here with her. But her family members tried to encourage her to get a new wheelchair, uh, but Ellen wanted nothing to do with that because it would most likely have come from the North. Another interesting story about Ellen that we like to tell is that her wishes when she died was to have a flower arrangement on her coffin in the form of a Confederate flag. So that should give you some sense of, of what Ellen was all about. <music> We're now at the children's level of the Bellamy Mansion. We can see that Dr. Bellamy did not incur any extra expenses in this floor. There's no carpeting, there's no fancy plaster, although the ceilings are coved to help move the air around. In the first small room in the back of the house is the tank room. This service room held the water that Guy would pump up every morning. The tub and scullery were below that and the water was gravity fed to serve them. All the plumbing was concentrated in that part of the house. Next to the tank room is a child's room and we can see 19th century furnishings in the room including a child's rope bed. It would be covered with a thin mattress but after a few nights the ropes would begin to sag and they had a tool 
to tighten it up, hence the expression, sleep tight. The painting over the mantel was badly damaged during the fire. We left it so you could see how badly damaging the fire was. On the same side in the front is a girl's room. It also has a rope bed with a thin mattress, a doll's bed in the same 19th century style, and on the other side you can see a washstand where you could take a nice cold bath in the morning. Underneath that is a chamber pot. It's a very long trek from up here to the privies in the slave quarters. So the chamber pot was quite useful and they were always furnished with a lid so that you didn't have to suffer any insalubrious breezes. In the hallway you can see the stage that is created by the ceiling of the veranda. Because the house is designed from the exterior, it creates a stage effect here. Ellen reported that she and Eliza would actually put on plays for their friends when they were little girls. Next to the stage you can see a small box. Inside is the key to the gas lights. When Mrs. Bellamy cut the gas lights off at night, there was nothing to do but sleep. You may wonder why there are interior windows in the hall. That helped to move the air around. It helped bring in light and it also allowed the nanny to supervise all the children from a central location. From here we're going to move up to the top of the house to the Belvedere. We're now in the Belvedere, my favorite part of the house. Belvedere comes from the Italian for beautiful view and there's certainly no finer view of Wilmington than from right here. To the west we can see the massive slate roof and towers of First Baptist Church. It was started at about the same time as the Bellamy Mansion, just before the Civil War. The war interrupted its building, and then uh, the aftermath meant there was no money to complete it, so it took 10 years to complete this building. Further down Market Street, we can see the Golden Domes of the Temple of Israel. It's the oldest synagogue in North Carolina and one of the 10 oldest in the United States. Further down Market Street, we can see some of the towers of St. James Episcopal Church. St. James is the oldest congregation in Wilmington, and its present building from the 1830s was one of the first neo-Gothic buildings in the United States. As we come back to the opposite corner from the house, we can see the Carolina Apartments. This early 20th century structure was very popular with filmmakers who wanted to depict New York City. Further down, looking south on Fifth Avenue, we can see the domes of the Basilica Shrine of St. Mary. It's one of only three basilicas in North Carolina. It has a twin in Asheville, St. Lawrence. They were both built without nails. And then further down Fifth Avenue, we can see the tower of Fifth Avenue Methodist Church. If we look east on Market Street, we can see the tower of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Like First Baptist, it was begun just before the Civil War and for the same reasons took 10 years to build. As we look north, we can see the tower of St. Stephen's AME Church. Before the Civil War, African Americans were not allowed to have churches of their own. After the Civil War, they began to build them and this was built by the members themselves. It's quite lovely. We can also see the stone tower of Grace Church in front of the PPD building. This is the successor church to Front Street Methodist Church where Dr. Bellamy was a member. Front Street welcomed everyone, including slaves, and had all-day Sunday school, accounting for the high level of literacy among Wilmington's African-American population by the end of the Civil War. You can see much of Wilmington's heritage and history just looking out these windows. As we make our way down to the kitchen level, I want to point out to you the slave staircase, or sometimes called the service staircase. This architectural feature is not visible from the outside of the house. It even has windows in it to make it look like it is part of the house. And this particular staircase has been featured in many architectural magazines. Imagine the amount of traffic on this staircase. Coal going up to feed the fireplaces, ashes coming down, dirty laundry coming down to be washed in the slave quarters, clean laundry up. The slave staircase provides access to the various levels of the house without the slaves having to use the central staircase. As we reach the base of the slave staircase, we'll be entering the kitchen, which is found in the English basement. 
This is an architectural feature. We're about four feet below grade level here. And many older homes that you have visited, the kitchen may have been in a separate building, but here at the Bellamy, the kitchen is indoors for two reasons. Number one, they're cooking on a stove, which is a lot safer than open hearth cooking. And number two, the kitchen is basically a brick-lined room, more or less fireproofed. Welcome to Sarah's Kitchen. Sarah's Kitchen is one of four rooms in the English or Daylight basement. On the north side of the wall, we have built-ins that are original to the room itself. The stove behind me, however, is not original. The original stove would have been cast iron, which was very common to have in the houses then. Ellen Bellamy tells us that Aunt Sarah used a hotel-sized stove because of the amount of people she would be feeding. This is a replacement dated in 1870, and it is from a relative's house added in the renovation. Across the room is a sugar cone. The sugar cones would have come packaged in the brown paper. Salt also came like that back in the day, and hence we get the term a pinch of sugar and a pinch of salt. We also have a pie safe. The pie safe would have held the dry goods and the baked goods and so forth. It has a punched tin exterior, which would have kept out the critters. And on the bottom, they would have put cups of water so that ants and other undesirables could not reach the goodies that would be inside. On the table here, we have a sampling of coastal cuisine, everything that is um, indigenous to the area, as well as tropical fruits that were made available because Wilmington was a very active port city. And now our next room is going to be the ironing room. This room is where the laundry would have been folded, sorted, and ironed. We have a historic display of irons here, uh, starting with the box iron. This box iron would have been very heavy and not very um, efficient as far as retaining the heat. The box irons were replaced by these. They are known as sad irons or flat irons. We now know them as doorstops and bookends. The sad irons were replaced by this wonderful invention, which came in the set of four items, three irons and a detachable wooden handle. So you'd have all three on the fire getting warm, one would cool off, you would just simply place it back on the fire, pick up the next one that was hot and ready to go, very efficient and safe because it wouldn't burn your hand. Having a butler's pantry is very rare, but it is a sign of a very wealthy, well-designed home. On the east wall, we have built-ins that are original to the house. Its finish is called ox blood or dragon's blood, and it is simply shellac with that pigment added to it. Inside the built-in is tea leaf china. It is of the period. It did not belong to Mrs. Bellamy, but it is on loan from a friend of the museum. It's interesting to note that on the bottom shelf is the children's china, and that's simply a miniature of the adult pattern. The food would have been plated by Guy and Sarah in this room right here. Guy, being the butler, would serve the food, and when the meal was finished, he would collect the dishes, they would be washed in the scullery, returned to the built-ins. The flooring here is not original to the house. This is an example of the original floorboard, and the reason it had to be replaced was we had incredible termite damage. The flooring that we're using now is part pine lumber, and it was from a cotton mill outside of Memphis that they were tearing down. We needed the wood that was of the period. It's an excellent example of recycling natural resources. And our next room is the last room in the house, the dining room. This is the 22nd room and the largest room in the house. The Bellamy selected the southwest position for the dining room with extra large windows. It keeps it cool and comfortable all year round, and with the extra windows, it's the sunniest side of the house. This room has a more formal finish than any of the other rooms on this floor, as it has molded cornices at the ceiling. The fireplace mantle is marbleized slate, and one of the interesting items in this room is hanging on the wall, and it's a shoe fly. The shoe fly is just a collection of peacock feathers, and it would be used by Caroline, the eight-year-old slave, who would have wanded the shoe fly over the food to keep the flies and other undesirable insects off of the food, because the windows would have been open and screens hadn't been invented yet. 
On the east wall, there's a sideboard, and on the sideboard is a sample of a holiday menu celebration. This celebration took place at Uncle Taylor's house, which is two doors down from here, because Dr. Bellamy was a very strict Methodist, and he was a teetotaler. He would not have had alcohol in this house. However, it was quite a different story from the looks of things at Uncle Taylor's house. As your tour concludes, I would like to again thank you for visiting with us today. Our staff, volunteers at the Bellamy Mansion, hope that this experience was special for you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at the Bellamy. Mm -hmm.